Hello, everyone. Welcome to the Social Studies Holler at theholler.org. I am Kim Surgent, the Social Studies Instructional Specialist for the KVEC region. And it's wonderful to be with you guys today because we're going to start looking at the inquiry in action. This, you know, I get asked all the time, especially in regards to our new standards for social studies in Kentucky, that, you know, teachers have no problem whatsoever, you know, really getting into the disciplinary strands. But when it comes to the inquiry component, because so much of that is dictated within instruction, that that is, you know, that's the sticky point sometimes for teachers. So what we want to do today is really help you guys, you know, see what this looks like, because that's the number one question I get when I go in to do trainings and everything. And even though teachers are experiencing it with a group of teachers, they really want to see it done with students. So the first question is, well, what does this look like in the classroom, really? So today we're going to have the opportunity to look at that or to listen to it. So we're going to visit Miss Bethany Coleman's sixth grade class. She is a teacher and her students attend Pikeville Elementary in Pikeville, Kentucky. So let's take a look at this and you're going to learn more about the lesson as we talk about it. This video is going to be divided into four sections or this podcast will be divided into four sections. We're first going to look at we're just going to kind of have an introduction to the class you know, kind of learning about what inquiry has meant for Ms. Coleman's classroom, how it has really changed her instructional practices, but most importantly, how it's impacted student learning. The second component is going to look at the separate in inquiry practices, and most importantly, looking at questioning, using evidence, and communicating conclusions. The third component is going to be that time that Ms. Coleman and I worked together to kind of talk about the lesson and talk about the disciplinary st standards and everything that were applied. So, Let's jump right into this. And this is Inquiry in Action with Ms. Bethany Coleman. So I think my students have really been impacted with inquiry um, through a lot of, they are engaged, um, they are motivated to really dig in and do research in the classroom. And when it's student led instead of teacher fed continuously throughout um, the lesson, I find that students help each other and are more peer, they respond better to their peers than they do if I'm just feeding the information to them individually. I think that as adults, we think that we are making those connections with our students and we are saying these things to them. We can read it in a textbook all day long and yes, I've hit A, B, C, and D, but it's not the same as letting them work through the process themselves. And I think she brings up a really good point in this. So let's talk about that first. And she keeps talking about how her students are responding. Her students are responding. And, and she even says no longer teacher fed, but student led. So I think when we start thinking about that aspect of inquiry, this is the part that sometimes is a little bit um, apprehensive for teachers. Because for one thing, you know, when you think about what instruction has looked like in a social studies classroom, let's say for at least the past 50 to 75 years, so much of that, so much of the energy and the learning has come from the front of the room, when in reality, where it needed to be all along was in the room with the students. Our responsibility is to teach, but theirs is to learn. But when we as teachers are micromanaging that learning, feeling that everything has to come through us in order for them to understand it, we really deprive the students of the opportunity to develop their own thinking, and most importantly, to develop their own thoughts about what it is that you're studying. Because we've always wanted, especially in social studies, we talk about creating those citizens and making them independent learners, yet we have managed all the learning. So what I love about this, she's talking about this, is how important it is that our students collaborate, which is a 21st century skill. And that's what we need our students to do anyway. So inquiry is a great way to bring that component into the classroom. Because sometimes where I may even forget to make a connection, a student will pick that up themselves and make broader connections that I would not even think to pull out of a textbook and read to them. And the students really just came in and they picked it up and they're running with it without me having to stand and lecture and take them through the process. Did you see all those hands up? Those hands were not up to make Miss Coleman look good in the classroom. Those hands were up because you know this B-roll here is actually her reviewing some of the you know supporting questions they had discussed in the classroom. So the students were ready to answer those because they had looked at multiple sources and they had all this information in their head and they were ready to share it because they were engaged with the content, not us. We're finding the sources that we need for uh, to talk about the Silk Road and find out what happened during it. They honestly learn more through inquiry by themselves than I could ever teach them. You can never really tr trust secondary or tertiary sources because you don't know if it's false evidence or if it's not reliable. Now that is social studies in action. That's what we as teachers want our kids thinking. And most impo importantly, we want them saying this. 
this student was not coached. This student did not know the question they were going to be asked until they came into the hallway to be interviewed. And this was completely unsolicited. When you've got students in sixth grade that are using words like primary, secondary, and tertiary in reference to sources, I think we're just doing some big deep learning there. To me, as an adult, it should be a clear answer. But if I'm giving them that, then that's not their self. They're not discovering on their own, and it's not their opinion. That's me teaching my opinion, not allowing them to use those critical thinking skills. Exactly, and that's the one thing as a social studies teacher we don't want to do. They need to learn to, to find their own sources, come up with their own answer. So that was one thing that I really struggled when I first started this, was I kept thinking, are we supposed to have a same end result? I kept thinking like typical assessment based. You have the same result. And it, I finally just went with the, it's not going to look the same. You notice how she said that she struggled with the definition of assessment, what assessment looked like in an inquiry classroom. And I think that's so important, especially for those of you who have, have looked at a practice test on the KDE website and, under accountability and assessment. So when you go in and you look at that, you know, you guys are seeing very different questions, but most importantly, you're seeing very different thinking for the students and very different actions on behalf of the student. So, you know, thinking about that, you can see here that that was a real adjustment for her. You could hear the trepidation a little bit in her voice, but you could also hear the relief, realizing that we're no longer looking for those cookie cutter answers because, you know, that in the past only said something about how what we taught. It didn't really say anything about the student learning and the student understanding. But now with our communicating conclusion standards, we're going to see much more independent thinking and independent development of thought. Sometimes you see students that will often struggle and expect things to be kind of spoon fed to them or they want me to hold their hand. Throughout inquiry, the students are jumping in and a lot of times it's the students that you least expect to come out with the most distinguished response and interpretation of the lesson. And it's, it's quite opposite of what we have always been taught with assessing content. Like we look for a, a standard end result and if we are allowing students to really dig in for themselves, they are assessing their, themselves even higher than what I could do. So before we go into using evidence, I wanna bring up a point here. When she talks about how it's students that surprise her or that would surprise you, that start excelling with an inquiry, that makes me think about the universe, universal design of learning. That because we're not staying within, you know, a mandated form of instruction, the whole thing of, you know, teacher dispenses, student responds, that whole kind of thing, that we're actually, we're no longer that, that one-way street or just, you know, now we're more of a two-way now there's going to be communication and collaboration and critical thinking and all of these, you know, 21st century skills that we really need those students to have. So students who have been waiting for us to meet them where they are, you have those students who excel in that, in that one way communication thing, because we could tell them things all day long. They're going to take it back. They're going to process it. They're going to regurgitate it. They're going to get a phenomenal grade. But those students that we've been looking at, like, I know you're listening to me. You're talking in class. Why am I not seeing, on, seeing it on the test? Why am I not seeing it in this assignment? Well, that's the beauty of inquiry, because you can come at it in multiple on-ramps and exit ramps. And so because students are coming into this and bringing their abilities and experience, assessing learning is going to look very different. And we're going to start hitting a lot more kids. We're going to change these kids and, and change who they are as a student because we are putting them in the driver's seat. As if you will grab out those social studies notebooks, turn to where we left off yesterday. Okay, now we're gonna look at questioning practice and we're, I'm numbering these just for organization, but when you think about the instructional process with an increase questioning, because all good learning starts with a question. Think about the last time that you had to learn something really quickly, you went into Google and you typed the question out. So why not us teach from the place where you're supposed to anyway, which is questions, so I want you to look at the really intentional way that she, and she does it seamlessly when she comes in and navigates through two different standards. She is looking at, and you're going to see this flash up on the screen, using evidence standard one. When she looks at question number one, which is developing compelling questions, you're going to see that. And then you're also going to see questioning standard two, which is generating supporting questions to investigate compelling questions. So you're going to see this as she comes into this. Grab your social studies notebooks and turn to where we left off yesterday. So you can still have those notebooks. 
So really quickly, we're going to recap everything that we've been doing for the last week. So tell me, what are we learning about right now? The Silk Road. The Silk Road, okay? And so we really have focused on developing a big brain compelling question. What was that compelling question? Should we really even call it the Silk Road, right? Um, so now tell me this before I go any further. What makes a compelling question a compelling question? It, can't just be yes or no. it cannot be just a yes or no. Like now notice she's really going deep into what a compelling question is. She's just not she's not just using the term and then jumping right into looking at their compelling question. She's being very intentional with this. When she does this with compelling questions, she does that again to always and consistently connect the students with the purpose of a compelling question because our compelling question directs our mini units or our big units. That's where all the learning feeds into and ultimately that compelling question also becomes your assessment. Shut case, right? What else? Arguable. Need to make it arguable. What else, Lucas? Uh, yes, yes, we can't argue. Mm -hmm. Any other things that we know make a compelling question a compelling question? Think of those writing ties. What have I told you when we do writing class? What do I look for at the very beginning of an essay when we're writing? A hook. A hook but what kind of question would only be considered a, a true hook? Question. A compelling question because what does it do? It's going to pull the reader in, right? It's not just a yes or no question. And then when we really dig into researching our compelling questions, we back that up with what? We ask, okay, we're finding evidence, but we have to ask more. And what kind of questions are those? Supporting questions. Did you see that? It was seamless. Because if you think about it, the relationship is very natural. You have that compelling question that organizes all of the learning. But in order to engage in that compelling question, you're going to have other questions that lead to your understanding of that compelling question, and those are supporting. Okay, so I think we all have the same notes. So we're answering... So now we're going to go into using evidence. So you guys can see that sometimes teachers will tell me, oh, inquiry feels like it takes forever because you start here and then you have to go here and here. So you guys can see this is all one class. So you're seeing it just, you know, one part flow into another. We've done some editing, but only for your time because we don't want, the, you know, don't want this to go on forever. You could sit and watch the whole class and you probably would like it. But, but in this case, we're, you know, editing it to hit the high points so you can recognize and see what this um, inquiry practice looks like in practice in the classroom. So now we're going to go into using evidence. Now, look who's doing all the work. That's all I'm going to say. What well, besides silk and other goods are shared on the Silk Road? Um, so let's use our evidence from the American Museum of Natural History. We're learning about primary sources, and Marco Polo was one of those sources. He actually traveled the Silk Road, so he was able to give us first-person evidence of the Silk Road. Yeah, because it was. So let's talk about that. So the using evidence standard that she has emphasized in this lesson. So now I can talk about that one, which is developing claims, citing relevant, relevant evidence, et cetera. You guys can go into the, and plus you're going to see the script on the screen, so you can read the standard there. So when you think about using evidence, what students are developing claims, because isn't that what a historian does? So she's going into, she's actually guiding them into this, this one specific source, and she's now, look, let's go look at this one. So they're going to talk about it. Is it a primary source? Is it secondary? And how does it support, you know, our supporting question, which is going to lead us to that compelling question. They traded silk a lot on the street. They traded yeah. a lot. It was a lot of silk, and yeah. since it was such high value, it was basically a form of currency in China. So that means it was a really high value. So really, we probably should call it the Silk Road. Now notice that she says we should call it the Silk Road. But now listen to this other student, what he says. True, because there's more than just silk traded on that road. <clears throat> so should it be called like the everything road or something like that? Um, my opposing view for yours. Although people say that the Silk Road is fitting to its name, it really isn't because like they put uh, spices and religion and all that stuff. And silk was a big export, but it wasn't the like it wasn't biggest. Really so notice how she actually looks at the student across from her, across from her, who had just given their claim. She identifies them. She goes now in a in opposition or opposing your claim, and she points that out, folks. That's counterclaim. That's some pretty high thinking. Okay, so think about that. That student actually identifies someone else's claim and is now going to you know give her evidence in opposition to, which is you know the, like you know like I just said is one of the highest forms of thinking, especially preparing students to write and engage in those writing standards. I think it's really awesome that you get to go 
it's like traveling back in time and getting to see the things that they wrote, the things that they told, the music that they listened to. That's pretty awesome. They traded, they shared religion, mm -hmm. shared culture. Yeah, they didn't just trade silk. They also shared, they also traded gold. I think we should write that on our thesis. So even though he says, I think we should write that on our thesis, because, you know, they were developing these and you're going to see what the assignment is now, which is going to be the communicating conclusion standard. But you can see how this is. I think we should write that. But you also see that, in you know, later discussion with them that a couple of people in that group were like, yeah, you may want to write that. But this is what I'm thinking. So this is going to be my thesis. So now let's go into inquiry practice four, which is communicating conclusions. We're going to take those supporting questions that we have built to support and answer our compelling question. Tell me the big brain compelling question we're answering Always again. connecting, always. Should we really call it the Silk Road, okay? Are you ready to start making a claim on what you think, yes or no, right? And it's, is it just going to be a yes or no answer? No, you're gonna stake a claim on what you think it should be called. So these are some examples of what I want you to make. Now your poster does not have to look exactly like this. Everyone's should actually look different. Well, everyone's thesis statement, going, is it going to look the same for everyone? No, your thesis, your thesis statement may be different from person. It actually probably should be. No two thesis statements should look exactly the same because it's your personal claim. But what you're going to do today is you're going to make a poster. Now, you can do this one of two ways. You have the option to do a Google slide as a digital poster, and I will print yours if you want to do it that way. If you want to put all of your images into a um, Google Doc and share with me, then I will print your images, and you can cut them out and do this, or you can draw. Okay, so let's talk about this a little bit. In preparation for the students to write, what she, you guys can see here what she's doing, which is having the students create a poster of visual images that are going to be clues or cues for their writing. So when you think about this, you know, she's, she's being very intentional, talking to them about how to use this, talking about their thesis statement, as she's calling it their thesis statement, but she's also very much connecting that to the claim. So here is a great example of how the reading and writing standards and the social study standards are just cross-pollinating, if you want to call it that. You know, they're, they're actually working, you know, together to, for the students to do their best work. So I, I love that she's actually going into this and she's, and she's creating these visuals because, again, that takes us to the universal design for learning. This is a whole idea of equity and access for all students to not only learn the content, that's why she uses multiple sources, but to also communicate their learning. Because they're made, you know, especially when we start thinking about modifications or accommodations for students, you, when you have this visual aid that's gonna help them for those students who are visually driven in their learning, and that is gonna be one way for you, that's gonna be their on-ramp to learn, their exit ramp is now going to be supported. Because, you know, in terms of developing their writing, especially if that student has to have some type of, of assistive, technolo assistive technology, because they're going to maybe talk, you know, do, do speak to text in Google or whatever it may be, they're going to be able to write their es essay now because they have these visual cues. Some of these posters, um, they did their own artwork and would draw on them, okay? But the one rule that I have is that you must have images on your poster. Why do you think I might do that? Okay, so if I hang it in the hallway, others might see the visualization and know what we're talking about too, right? Now, can I put an image of the Statue of Liberty on here? No. Would that make any sense whatsoever? No. So what images am I looking for on your poster? What should be on there that we have learned that you may use as part of your evidence to support your claim on your poster? Things they traded on the Silk Road, right? What else, Matthew? Absolutely, you could definitely get a map of the Silk Road put on there. Pictures of the silkworms, right? Any of those. So I want to pause here. So these students are actually cueing you in on the types of sources that they looked at. They used, you know, multiple maps. They looked at, you know, multiple images, you know, pictures of the silkworms. At one point that, you know, the students actually wanted to know more about the silkworms. And uh, part of that discussion that day that we saw was a student was talking about how long that it took for a silkworm to actually weave or create, uh, you know, just a very small piece of the silk. So you were talking about the intensity of the labor and everything. That was just one or two of the sources that they looked at, but the students knew that this needed to be, especially if you're talking about the Silk Road, it needed to be, you know, one of the images so that it would be, could be used as evidence to support their writing. Connections that apply to the claim that you're making. Are you ready? And grab a Chromebook. You all are going to talk through your claim before you write your thesis. 
your claim. What evidence are you going to use to back up your claim? I'm going to give you about 10 minutes to come up with your claim. Talk to each other. You can argue about it, debate it. But everyone's claim should be different. Remember, the goal is not to have the same exact thesis statement, okay? You're going to, don't stress over the thesis statement yet. What did I just say? We're going to do this for two days. You got me? I got you. Ready? How many days are we working on this? We're going to finish it tomorrow, and that's when you worry about your thesis statement. The moment that she said, you have two days to do this, some of you went, oh, but I can't lose two days of instruction. Let me ask you, you're not even looking at the whole class, but how much learning has taken place through this inquiry? It's so much more than us disp dispensing that knowledge. It would have taken weeks to teach, or, you know, well over a week for one teacher to have taught all of this, but in one week, they have done all of this because they've used the multiple sources. So to say to take two days to write, you're thinking those two days that these students are going to be reviewing those sources, reinforcing their learning. They're going to be using these sources to develop their claim. They are organizing their thinking. And as they look over those sources, they're looking at their evidence. We have to remember that, you know, as Carol Mullins, our KVEC reading and writing guru, okay, when you think, you know, she, she tells her people in, in trainings from the book, The Writing Revolution, the author there says that writing is taught, not caught. Miss Coleman is making a very intentional move in connecting the students with the thinking and the preparation to write. Just because students have seen the evidence does not mean they go immediately into the writing process. All too often, I remember as a student, that was expected of me, that I had to go off and, and you know, and learn and, you know, review on my own and then come back in and write that immediately. But she is really making those, as she says, big brain connections using the compelling question, the supporting questions, the visuals, which is all the primary and secondary sources, and bringing those in. I mean, she is touching every part of the inquiry in this assignment. And this is why it's communicating conclusions, which is constructing an argument, argument using claims and evidence from multiple sources. And that's what's happening here. So what you guys have seen is a, you know, a very quick look into what inquiry looks like in the classroom. I hope this has kind of helped you see how these, these standards are being applied pretty seamlessly. Again, I'm going to use that word because, you know, I think the big thing that teachers are always, always asking about whenever we start talking about inquiry, what they want to see is student engagement and active learning. So my reflection question for you as we close up today is how much of each of those did you see or did you hear as you listen today? Again, it's wonderful being with you guys from The Holler. I'm very excited about this new series, Inquiry in Action, and look forward to episode two with you guys. This has been a Holler production brought to you by the Kentucky Valley Educational Cooperative and theholler.org. Thank you so much for listening. We'll holler at you next time.